right. Okay, there we go. So, Hoi van Nieland. Thank you so much, sir. And thanks for having me. And also a special thank you to my friends in Australia and New Zealand for making it at this early hour. Um, I'm kind of wondering what does Friday look for us look like so far? Are we having a good Friday ahead of us, the rest of the world? Or remember that we're in the southern hemisphere, it's summer, so every day's a party. But, but rainy. A rainy, but rainy, correct. Day. Yeah. <laughs> we need it. So it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when every other day is sunny, you don't mind a little clouds. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. Noted. Duly noted. All right. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, a topic that is on more or less everyone's mind these days, I dare say, and the pandemic, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and one of the things that is, or one of the topics, one of the key buzzwords uh, I think I hear all the time is trust. Uh, the fact that uh, we are, or especially the public health authorities, they are wanting that trust in the way that they can handle this pandemic. So trust in the authorities, trust between citizens, uh, trust uh, towards the media and the messages they broadcast and so forth. Uh, but the, ba the key issue here, I think, is as a communication scholar is, of course, why should anyone trust what you're saying? Why should anyone trust what you're saying? Um, and if you look at social media, for instance, you will find tons of examples of how people do not trust the public health authorities to handle this pandemic. Here is just one post that I pulled off the internet uh, last night, um, and it's a post discussing the efficiency of the vaccines. Um, this person posted uh, something to the extent of saying something to the extent of uh, it has been claimed uh, that the vaccine is 90% effective and secure, but independent experts uh, have a contrary meaning. Uh, they're saying that the vaccine is 0.2% percent effective and extremely dangerous. So this person concludes that uh, I definitely trust the independent experts most and they have warned against the vaccine. So this is just one example of the kind of lack of trust that some people have in how the public health authorities are handling the situation. Now, what I will do in this talk is um, touch upon how uh, the public health authorities in my home country of Norway, how they uh, have come up with certain rhetorical strategies in this situation. Uh, I will talk very, very briefly about social media and the so role of social media. Um, and I will return to this issue of trust and how that plays a role in this pandemic. And finally, I will talk a little bit about possible future strategies that public health authorities can use to build trust. And obviously I welcome all comments and do ask questions. And Michael had promised that uh, he will alert me to possible questions in the chat and so forth. And really, I'm really eager to learn here because uh, and to discuss with you because these ideas that I present are very much ongoing research uh, that has not been presented in journal articles so far. But um, I am going to discuss uh, findings or preliminary findings from a research project that I'm running these days. Uh, it's a project financed by the Norwegian Research Council. Um, we've got 540,000 euros for this project. And it's kind of an exciting project in the sense that I'm not only working with colleagues in my department, uh, the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Oslo, uh, I'm also working with data scientists uh, at a research lab called Sintef in Norway. Uh, and I'm also working with experts in survey research uh, coming from political science, sociology, uh, and they're located at the Institute for Social Research. But what I'm most excited about is the fact that as a partner in this research project, we have the Institute, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. We have people from uh, the quote unquote professional side, that is medical doctors, epidemiolog epidemi 
Please help me out. Epidemiologists. I think we got it there. Um, and the communication director of uh, this institute is on board together with the person responsible for the vaccine communication. Um, in addition, we have uh, people from the uh, journalist circles, that is, we have the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation on board, the head of uh, editorial ethics and standards, um, and we have the secretary general of the Association of Norwegian Editors on board as well, and a survey partner in, uh, on top of this. And in this particular project, we are conducting qualitative interviews with uh, people engaged in communication on behalf of the public health authorities. We are scraping social media and indexing social media, uh, trying to capture the way that people discuss uh, the pandemic in social media, with a focus on Norway, I have to say. And in addition, we run surveys. We have, three, have had three rounds of surveys so far, uh, and we'll, I'll, we'll also be talking about some of the preliminary results from these surveys. Now, I think as every academic with a bit of self-respect these days, you got to have two projects running on COVID, right? <laughs> so uh, this project is linked to a project that I, I actually started ahead of COVID-19, that is a project focusing fair and square on pandemic rhetoric. Um, and this project is much larger in the sense that we got more funds. Um, it's quite a fun project as well. I'm working with rhetoricians and we're doing interviews, we're doing observation. I have a PhD student actually participating in the meetings of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and the Norwegian uh, Directorate of Health. So we have some really, really interesting and fascinating insights. He's been following uh, this department uh, since March um, and uh, they've been very open uh, in this regard and uh, these days he's, he's sitting in on their digital morning meetings and we got tons of good stuff from there. Um, in this project we also run focus groups, we have the traditional contextual analysis and we also have a focus on uh, how the public health authorities in Sweden and Denmark are doing these things. So it's a very much a comparative project. So with these two projects in mind, uh, I have tons of data and I will try to present some of it for you. Uh, and I'm also again, eager to hear uh, your views on this because again, uh, for the umpteen time, uh, this is uh, very much a presentation with preliminary findings. But the first question uh, that I'm posing here is what content and rhetorical strategies are pursued by Norwegian public health authorities concerning COVID-19? And as um, most of you, I guess, would be familiar with, um, it's not easy to find this uh, holy grail. Um, I mean, the holy grail, those buttons that we all seek, which buttons should we try to push on to have a certain effect on the audience? Um, and as every, I'm guessing most of you would uh, know already, uh, what is uh, perceived as trustworthy is certainly very much situational. So whereas the persuasion researchers over the years have tried to uh, come up with, uh, with experiments and work through how you can actually push these buttons, every rhetorician would run in and say that uh, it depends. So having that in mind is something that we are also selling, quote unquote, to the public health authorities when we're talking to them. But uh, of course, there are some principles that uh, can be recognized. For instance, that in areas uh, where there are uncertainties, uh, where no exact knowledge exists, we pretty much start to look at the person uh, communicating this message. The character of the speaker becomes really, really important. And this has given rise to some new stars in the Norwegian um, field. That is, uh, for instance, this guy. Uh, this guy who was totally unknown before the pandemic, he's risen to a level of fame because basically he's a very good communicator. And this comes true in the uh, focus group research that we've done as well. That is, we've asked people who they trust and why they trust this person or this organization. 
So uh, what comes up in the research or the focus groups we conduct is that this guy, he's seen as a good communicator because he is very easy to understand his message. And he's a quite likable guy. Hence, he uh, started off as an assistant to the director of the uh, Norwegian Directorate of, of Health. Um, and now he's sort of rising through the ranks because he's so good at his work that he's appearing more or less more often, or at least uh, more frequently than, than uh, the very head of this directorate, which is kind of, kind of interesting. But if you're further, if you're looking at how do people actually build their ethos, how do they build their credibility? Obviously, being a commu good communicator, expressing messages in a simple, uh, understandable way is one way. But as we know from rhetorical theory, uh, you could pinpoint at least three strategies that can be used. First of all, um, uh, pointing to the competence or demonstrating that you actually know what you're talking about, uh, getting that understanding across that you're a competent person or a competent organization in this regard. That is one key strategy. The other strategy would be uh, virtue. Uh, that is, virtue is something that also strengthens ethos credibility. Uh, that you seem to be a trustworthy person. You seem to be a trustworthy uh, organization. Uh, and the third strategy would then be goodwill, uh, that you actually demonstrate that you care for your audience. And these three strategies uh, I'm trying to apply and try to pinpoint exactly how have uh, the Norwegian public health authorities got, tried to build their trust, try to build their credibilities, try to strengthen their ethos in this pandemic situation. And what I find first is that um, the most important part here would probably be the strengthening of competence, that is trying to highlight why we should trust uh, the public health authority, uh, authorities in this regard and not individual uh, medical practitioners. Why we should not trust people that hasn't got the professional training. Why we should not trust people who have a strong opinion that they're voicing in social media and why we should go back to the public health authorities. But obviously um, this competence uh, is sometimes challenged or what happens when the competence is challenged, that is kind of the first interesting part that we stumbled upon. And I want to take you back to this uh, a case uh, in March 2020, because um, in a debate program in Norway, uh, a medical doctor uh, argued that the public health authorities are not doing the right thing. They're having their, their measures, uh, their attempt to curb or strike down the virus, it's simply not strong enough. We have to seal off the borders, we have to send everybody in quarantine and so forth and so on. So this particular uh, medical doctor was on this debate program and she basically scared a lot of people calling for, well, saying basically that, that this is like seeing the German invasion, uh, seeing the German warships coming up the fjord of, uh, outside of Oslo and we are under attack and we have to act accordingly. So a pretty harsh message and again, calling into question the uh, authorities' uh, way of handling the debate. Now, in this particular debate program, um, of course, uh, the public health authorities were given the chance to, but in th this period, uh, they trusted or they relied also quite a lot on video links. So in this regard, uh, or in this deb debate program, they pulled in two persons from the public public health authorities represented by, by these two guys um, and ask them about their feelings, their ideas about this message from this medical doctor. And the interesting thing here for me and the rest of uh, the team I'm working with is, so how would the trust be negotiated? How would the ethos be negotiated in this particular instance? And what we found was that the work of um, uh, Johanna Hartelius um, <clears throat> would be very interesting to use 
sorry, um, would be very interesting to use in this regard. Uh, she's written a book called The Rhetoric of Expertise. And we try to apply that framework, that uh, theoretical framework on this debate to see how, again, ethos was negotiated between these actors. And Johanna Hartelius' work, um, she talks about um, at least six strategies uh, that are applied or used by actors. First of all, um, actors like, for instance, the Norwegian public health authorities, they would point to how they were a part of a broader network of experts. So just being able to people to defend the, uh, the public authorities, that would be a good thing. You had two different experts and they could point to different uh, publications and how they would be in agreement with uh, international experts and so forth and so on. So pushing this expert network uh, would be one key strategy here. And in addition, of course, um, you have the expert technique, you have the expert's way of talking about and trying to uh, reach epistemic knowledge. Um, you would have specialty language and so forth, but this would also point to how you would get at that type of knowledge that you would need. Um, but you would also have to be able to explain this to the audience. So the third strategy would be expert pedagogy. Um, and then uh, you would or you would let the people or the audience in uh, as participants or not. Um, but in this particular case, uh, the expertise as a fitting response to the situation was really what sh came true the strongest. Uh, these experts from the Norwegian public health authorities, they were defending themselves, not only by pointing to how they were part of an expert network, but also how their particular expertise would be a fitting response to the situation. And the sixth uh, strategy mentioned by Johanna Hertelius is relevance to everyday life. And this also came true in this particular instance. So these strategies uh, were applied more or less, all of them, in this in this um, this program um, by the Norwegian health authorities, and obviously um, the MD as well, the one criticizing the public health authorities, she was also trying to use some of these strategies, but she was sort of painted uh, as a lone researcher. Uh, fighting against all the others. And we argue that that sort of put her at odds uh, with uh, the Norwegian public health authorities. And uh, she was uh, kind of uh, taken down a little bit uh, by, uh, by people in, in, in social media as well afterwards. And in this paper we're working on, we are also dealing with, with those ideas. But Again, uh, competence is one of the key strategies to uh, strengthen your ethos. You will uh, emphasize how you are a competent person uh, or a competent organization. And in the uh, focus group research we've uh, done as well, we're just in the midst of uh, analyzing the results. Uh, but what came, came true the clearest uh, was that competence is the most frequently mentioned term when people said, uh, or when people try to reason why they would trust somebody. And people were pointing to how, well, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, they're professionals. They know what we're talking about. We trust the, those people. So that would be kind of the first and most important strategy uh, of the authorities. But then you have a second uh, strategy that we uh, sort of uh, isolated or sort of focused on, uh, and that would be virtue. Uh, the trustworthiness stemming from uh, you as a person, you as an organization, just being believable, just being this nice person, or in this case, being transparent about how you don't know everything. Uh, that very uncertainty of the situation is something that was highlighted uh, by or something that is highlighted uh, in the material as well. The uncertainty of the situation uh, and how you would 
if you, if you come across as somebody who is willing to talk about how you don't know everything, how you uh, can't come up with answer for everything, you, you're transparent and you're sort of strengthening the virtue, strengthening your ethos through this. Uh, and this, at least this is something that we argue uh, in our work. Um, and we could also see, um, apologies for these, um, these um, news clippings that are in Norwegian, but um, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health um, and the Norwegian uh, Directorate, or sorry, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, they got two prizes for openness or transparency uh, last year. Uh, so apparently this was something that paid off, uh, at least in some circles. But uh, what we're really interesting in uh, as well is that um, there, is some, there is a little bit of tension here, because if you're trying to build virtue through transparency and admitting to the fact that, well, we don't know everything, uh, there are uncertainties here, we don't know, this could very easily uh, be uh, at odds with uh, the strategies that you use to strengthen your competence. Um, you could get the question, aren't you supposed to be the experts here? Um, so why can't you come up with an answer for this? Uh, and this type of tension is something that we explore as well, and we explore this in the research uh, or in the focus groups as well. But what we would like for this to happen or for this to result in is that uh, a way of talking about uncertainty. We would like to come up with some ideas for a rhetoric of uncertainty. And here again, I'm very interested in uh, learning uh, your views on this. Um, so I'm, I'm more than willing to take questions straight away. Any? Comments, views? Michael, would you do the honors of? Sorry, there we go. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the you you mentioned word trust to the institution. Yeah. And when 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 it comes about Norwegian Institute, which presumably operates for decades, probably yes several yeah. decades or so yes so so that the institution has the some some history some uh, professionalism which they already showed in 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 uh, previous pandemics and i personally knew I, i'm from ukraine i'm i'm working with local uh, public health center which is the analog of, of the same institution which was just established several years ago you know like four years ago only, you know, and now they start, they, they're, they're trying to establish the reputation, like that they are professional, and alongside with, uh, with response to pandemic, and, and that's uh, absolutely, uh, uh, they're not very, uh, they're not mastered in this, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty di difficult to build reputation with uh, with the uh, response um, to pandemic, don't, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think? You're totally right. Um, I have to say also that um, my feeling, my guess is that ahead of the pandemic, not that many people uh, in Norway would know the difference between the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and the Directorate of Public Health, for instance. So mm -hmm. uh, these institutions are kind of lumped together uh, and seen as representatives of the authorities. Uh, but you're totally right in the sense that um, Norway is a high trust society, and I'll also return to that a little later because that gives a leverage to the uh, Norwegian Public Health Institutes or the Public Health Directorate. Um, they have a, have a reservoir of trust there already, um, and uh, this is something that becomes really important, say, in terms of vaccine communication and also, of course, adherence to to um, to the measures. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll return to that uh, when I talk more specifically about trust. I think. Uh, but I'm really eager to hear uh, to hear if anybody has some ideas for a rhetoric of uncertainty? Uh, would it be possible to isolate, like, say, five, six strategies, uh, like the ones that are used for the rhetoric of expertise? Um, 
I did it in a political discourse, but from a linguistic perspective. So my focus was mainly on um, some elements like hedges and boosters and how mm -hmm. they hedge their bets uh, when they are uncertain. So uh, it's not like always through just some, um, let's say, uh, particles. It can be like the whole expression expressing a kind of like subtle uh, lack of certainty or uh, increasing certainty. So I would do like fine grained analyses of these kind of uh, strategies. And yeah, I have a classification of that. Oh, I'd be really interested to see that. Yeah, I have published it so I can forward it. Uh, oh, the, please. Yeah. 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 I, I've also tried to, or I will look into uh, the writings on climate change as well, because climate change change and uncertainty uh, it's quite a big thing as well uh, but I haven't gotten so far yet but uh, we'll uh, we, we can also uh, or probably you have already done that like uh, look at the multimodal sources uh, mm -hmm. that they use to um, like one of the movement we saw on uh, on the media is how the leaders are receiving jabs as the first person to uh, build trust between people and uh, the like scientific aspects of of the vaccine so um yeah so probably looking at these and if there are any other multimodal sources again at a fine grain level like uh yeah, yeah. good yeah yeah the, the whole field of science communication is i published a piece um, quite or a commentary uh, quite recently uh, on uh, the uh, well trying to merge science communication and communication on vaccine um, from a rhetorical perspective yeah. and uh, yeah I will continue exploring that so but I'm really eager to uh, to see what you've written uh, Maria. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you already noted this, but there's also, I mean, there's this general undermining of science, undermining of you know trust in institutions. And uh, we see that in, you know, the flat earthers who surprisingly are growing all across the world and the, you know, anti-vax conspiracies and all these others is this sense that, uh, and you mentioned this, but just, you know, like, oh, you're, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You're uncertain. Why can't you tell us the truth? Instead of a recognition that that's how decisions are made, whether it's science decisions, you know, good decisions change their views when new information comes in and it's that move for certainty i think to say that if you're uncertain you can't be trusted um that i think is part of this mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. i also uh, another issue is is a political agenda because uh, a lot of politicians are trying to uh to to dance on uh, on this uh, situation you know and in 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 a lot of countries, uh, they they had uh, the protests of small businesses of well, I don't know uh, music uh, uh, music business how to say show business yes show so, business <laughs> yeah in 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 Ukraine it's it's uh, it's it's a mess you know every all all opposition parties are. Uh, how to say opposite to these lockdowns, to vaccination, to everything. So because they they for people. And so. Agree. I also think and it's not only not, not, not only in Ukraine. In, in it's America. everywhere. So, yeah. yeah. One of the things that we uh, we've been working with the WHO in Geneva to help them understand how to improve their communication. And one of the things that we've discovered is that people don't like uncertainty. They want to be told the uh, the truth or the reality and science is always evolving when you have like a, a covid or climate change right the science is always changing so little little itty bitty pieces of change all of a sudden undermine the credibility of messaging once we remember in the beginning the who said no you don't need to wear masks well they did that for a variety of reasons because they thought it was actually spread by touch and they wanted to save the masks for health workers. Now it's wear a mask and everyone's like, well, look, you've changed your, your policy, but science is always evolving and health information evolves as more and more people study it. So in the rhetoric of certainty, being able to explain that science is an evolving knowledge base and that what we knew two weeks ago isn't, isn't the same as that we know today and what we know tomorrow might contradict it. That's really complex and trying to tell that story in social media sound bites or media sound bites is very is very different and it didn't work well 
So we we need to a go back to trusting in science, but b tell that science story better about the evolution of knowledge and it's two steps forward and one step back sometimes. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, and we see that in our material as well. The whole thing with the now you're saying we should wear a mask, but in March we shouldn't wear a mask. So uh, that's a very good point. And, and we've also been discussing this with the practitioners, the, the uh, challenge of saying that what we say today uh, won't necessarily be true tomorrow. And yeah, it's, it's an uphill, um, uphill battle, I'd say. Um, May I also make a comment here? And I'm sorry, I have some Zoom issues, so I have no idea if you see me or not. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, my question in regards to, I actually had two questions, but I don't know, you probably discussed them already. Um, my first question was whether people who are not trustworthy right away, like who should not be trustworthy, can use the same rhetorics of trust to build trust, like, you know, all those um, people who spread misinformation. That was the first question. And the second question was, in relation to the comment by Dr. Taylor about the uncertainty and in relation to you know your, your points about the rhetoric of uncertainty, uh, from the public center perspective, uncertainty actually increases public's engagement with the topic. Because when people, when, when there's uncertainty now, there is something to discuss, there's something to co-create, there's something to come up with, kind of to feel, they, they try to fill this gap, this uncertainty. And I guess my question is, how can we use this uncertainty in a good way? Um, if you have any ideas, you know, to use it in a way that engage publics to learn more and to learn the truthful facts rather than to come up with something uh, that's not truthful and not right. Am I mm. hitting the point? <laughs> yeah. um, to the first question, whether or not uh, this type of rhetoric could be used by evil people. Uh, yes, it can. Uh, that's the Hitler problem of rhetoric, I suppose. Um, uh, that is, rhetoric can be used for good and bad, bad purposes. Um, Having said that, though, of course, you have people insisting that, well, a bad person cannot really be a good rhetorician. So a good person communicating well is kind of the rhetorical ideal forwarded by Quintilian and then uh, picked up by Bob Heath saying that, well, it's a good <laughs> rhetoric. It's about a good organization communicating well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, I think we as researchers can only do as much as point out these uh, tools are used for, and can be used. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. I'm, I know we have a little or we have uh, differences on this, but um, that is my take at least. Uh, in terms <coughs> of certainty, that's really something that I'm dying to explore. Um, uh, and how that could increase engagement. So that's just something that I will write down and, and ponder. Thanks for the I, question. I um, wanted to mention, Anna made me think about this when she started uh, with her question. The idea of groupthink, I think, is also fits into this because, you know, when people are, uh, are communicating in a way that's trustworthy, in a way that's open, of course, we don't question it. You can only sort of look at the symptoms of a bad communication of an F and, and there are certain symptoms that are apparent. So I think Anna's question about, can you sort of use the same principles? You can't because when you're sowing mistrust, you're not being honest. And when you're trying to make people not trust the other, you're um, being deceptive. You're actually not engaging in those rhetorical principles of, of openness and trust. You're not the good person speaking well, but if you're doing it, you know, um, people don't question it, I guess, is, you know, so I'm not sure, but it just seems like that idea of sort of, uh, we're not gonna, we, we can't prove the positive, we can only sort of look for symptoms of the negative seems to be part of this. Uh, Any other comments? Yeah, Questions? Uh, just the uh, last one. Um, so another insight from linguistics again, <laughs> uh, we have uh, evidentiality, which is like, what kind of resource, what kind of sources you rely on to bolster your claims. So a classification of those sources uh, would also be helpful because um, like as an expert, I would rely on, like as a health expert, I, I would rely on science, while other politicians would rely on different sources, um, influencers, or I don't know, like uh, 
people on social media would refer to different sources and people would tend like to um, uh, sort of make that kind of categorization in their mind. So as, as you said, like uh, we have a sort of like a timeline of, as how like pe issues were um, negotiated. Uh, so people would have some kind of like categorization of those sources in their mind, as we can call them like evidentiality. So eventually they would know which ones to trust and which ones not to trust. Um, so I think that would be also helpful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I will soldier on. Um, my team has... Um, also looked into how this new phenomenon, uh, I mean, I mentioned that we've gotten new experts in the media landscape, that is uh, people that uh, has been come famous uh, coming from the ranks of bureaucracy in, uh, in the public health sector. Um, and uh, some of these portraits are really uh, stressing the trials and tribulations of the expert, and we're trying, they're trying to get at the person behind the, uh, the mask. I, I mean, the person uh, or the expert becomes a person. Uh, and this has led us to ponder whether or not this would be something that uh, the public health authorities should emphasize, uh, but we've kind of landed upon uh, the idea that, well, if, if you're asked, you, could, you shouldn't be afraid to be personal uh, because uh, that would strengthen the authenticity um, of you as an expert. But this is, again, just some ideas that we're, we're playing with. Um, what we have noticed in the focus group research is that people have a tendency to recognize uncertainties, to recognize that the experts cannot always know everything and they accept uncertainties. But again, uh, this is Norway, um, which is a high trust country. Uh, so the same or the results might, might vary um, in other countries. The third rhetorical strategy that we're playing with um, is uh, to see how uh, the public health authorities are trying to strengthen goodwill. That is to show that they care about the audience. And what we find is that, um, I'm not certain this dialogue word, Michael, Maureen, Petra, have you heard about that? No. No, it's, it's this new concept. Uh, um, engagement is another key concept, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, you might want to look into that, yeah. Um, anyway, um, just bad jokes, sorry. Um, dialogue service, uh, helping uh, social media uh, users uh, who ask the Public Health uh, Institute for uh, advice that this particular institute cannot give, they will direct them towards the institution that has answers uh, for this, uh, for their questions. And they would engage with a friendly and respectful tone and all this that you know from uh, research on social media. Um, but there is, a lot of distrust out there. And uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. Um, this stems from, from spring, uh, last spring. Um, it's a, basically, it's a post saying that you wanted the virus to spread so you can test this model that you're so obsessed with. I mean, this, this is directed at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. So you want a human experiment. Oh, I really look forward to the aftermath of this because somebody uh, will hang. Uh, and this is my favorite because, um, believe it or not, this post is written by a professor, a full professor of public trust. Um, I'm wow. not certain how this came about. Uh, I don't know the person, but uh, yeah, I find it truly interesting. He doesn't trust uh, the Norwegian Public Health Institute. But for the most part, um, the Public Health Institute, they will uh, be, they will invite and tackle questions and they will conduct the dialogue in a polite and conversational voice like, like uh, uh, Keller, uh, Tom Keller would, uh, would have it, I suppose. And I'm sure Mike and Maureen and Petra, you might have something to say here as well. Um, 
But the rhetoric of goodwill is really something that we're looking to develop uh, in this, uh, this project. What kind of strategies do the or, or overarching strategies do the uh, public health authorities use in this regard? So this is also uh, an area where I would very much like to hear your comments. Uh, what kind of elements would you see go into a rhetoric of goodwill? Can we come up with something that is comparable to this, this typology of the uh, rhetoric of expertise? Or is this something that is uh, a dead horse? Any views? Well, um, you know, I... Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Well, um, to me, it was more about I cannot help you with the rhetoric of with the goodwill, but what I was thinking again, um, a little bit, I guess, from where I'm coming from in terms of the public-centered communication. So we talk about this rhetoric of goodwill as applied and practiced by the experts, by the practitioners, by the um, healthcare professionals. But then what we also see, we see that simultaneously at the same um context, communicative co context at the same discourse, we see how publics discuss and what they discuss and what they say. And a lot of the time, how publics discuss and how publics talk have nothing in common with the goodwill actually, right? Because they actually marginalize the other, right? If you don't wear the mask, you're an evil, or if you wear a mask, you're stupid or whatever they're coming up, right? So there's a very simple kind of logical patterns they use and this marginal marginalization is real so to what extent we can really sort of separate you know communication of professionals and communication of the publics and I guess also how how the goodwill can be and, and this is probably not the question you can answer but we can probably think together a little bit about this how can the goodwill be for certain achieved in this case, you know, would it even be attainable, you know, this kind of situation? Uh, hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, la last year I, sp I, sp I spent consulting uh, mayors of small small towns. And you know, when, when the COVID-19 started, uh, central government practically didn't give any guidelines what to do so people were absolutely in despair because they absolutely like, you know people didn't understand where, where this virus appeared how it spread why they see they think there are there were a lot of conspiracy theories and so on and uh, i consulted mayors and tried and uh, and, and i consulted them to to, to, to start talk to them uh, directly to their community members through social media. So social media was the, the main, how to say, tool for them. So they communicated uh, personally from, from their personal accounts, not from the accounts of mayor, mayor at yes, but from with, with their uh, photo, with their name and so on. And, and they started to communicate with them. I, I will come to you. I understand your fears. I, I know this is very difficult, blah, 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 but this is our community and we we, try, we will do something inside. Our, 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 our guarantee that we will do everything we can do together. So there are some, how say, external, external uh, influences but what we can provide in our community we can we, we will do so like masks whatever tests and so on so so i think uh, credibility is the, the main point of goodwill because if people do, do, do not trust uh, if 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 person is not credible so they will they will not find the goodwill in his words i would say sorry maybe again uh, so some 
So I always think that goodwill is part of ethos, you know, confidence, integrity, and goodwill. And I think it's an interesting question to ask, you know, how do we build goodwill? And so on, on my list, I had that same thing. Credentialing is part of that, right? To sort of show, look, here's why we're, you know, an expert. Here's why we care. But if you think about some of those other things that are part of that, you know, when we lived in Oklahoma, there was this weather man, weather guy, and Gary had been doing the weather for like 100 years. And he was getting so he couldn't really work the technology very well. You know, it was all this new technology, computers, and he wasn't very good with it. But everybody loved him, you know. And so he would come on and he would get agitated because he couldn't make things work. And, and there was this younger guy that, you know, they sort of were grooming for the job. But, um, you know, part of it, I think, is that credibility. Then there's also the, the, the time we spend, right, being, uh, you know, um, interactions over time and I think also access the ability that you, that these people can be reached that you can ask these people a question you know anybody who's tried to get in touch with a bureaucrat knows they're often difficult to talk to and of course politicians don't at least in you know in the U.S. and Australia aren't as open about giving you access to how to get in touch with them you got to go searching for it so I think all of those are features of goodwill would be you know access and exposure and credibility I wonder if one other example of goodwill um, for um, specifically in New South Wales would be the way they relaxed restrictions on Christmas Day. So it's a really practical way of saying, look, we understand you have some, you know, emotional and mental and social needs. Um, so even though we're in this strict lockdown, we're going to let you have 10 people over on Christmas Day instead of instead of five. And these are really um, practical policy um, ways of building goodwill as well. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm really dying to dive into this data again and bring your input with me. Um, so yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, one of the points that I would like to underscore, uh, namely that ethos, uh, again, there are three ways, according to Aristotle at least, uh, three ways that you build uh, your ethos, that you strengthen your ethos is through pointing to your competence, it's uh, demonstrating that you are a good person or have somebody else demonstrate that you're a good person or a good organization, and then show that you care for your audience, uh, you care for their interests. Have those 10 people over for Christmas instead of five, uh, pick up on the last point by Aaron. Uh, but the big question, of course, is does this work? Um, does, the, uh, does it work? I mean, we've tried to unpick some of the rhetorical strategies used by the Norwegian public health authorities. And um, we cannot, of course, point to causality here from the rhetoric, but we can point to uh, the coexistence of a quite high level of trust. So these are figures taken from uh, surveys conducted by the public health authorities themselves. Um, and they showed that to a very high degree, uh, they have, the public have, uh, uh, have a great faith in the ability of the uh, public health authorities to handle the COVID-19 situation. Uh, these are figures uh, that has tracked, uh, or the survey has run from February uh, last year until uh, this very day, uh, and it continues. So we have some wonderful data here uh, that we can use as well. And you can see that uh, uh, the faith or the trust in the ability of the authorities uh, took a slump uh, in beginning of, or in March, uh, February, March, uh, and then climbed up again. Um, and what happened uh, here was the lockdown on Norway, uh, of Norway. Um, and people were saying, uh, or people were kind of expecting this uh, and didn't think the authorities were doing enough. That's our reading of this, these data, or this data set at least. Um, but what you've seen is that after this, uh, it has been relatively steady. Uh, the trust level has been relatively steady. So again, we're not claiming uh, any kind of causality here, but what we can say for certain is that the Norwegian public health authorities have not squandered people's trust in them. So we find that particularly interesting and we will dig into this more as well. Now, um, I talked a little bit about rhetoric um, and uh, I, in this project uh, or this pro the main project that I'm presenting today, uh, we are also looking into 
role of social media. Um, that is, we're exploring the relationship between the strategies of the health authorities, the social media comments, and discussions uh, of the handling of the same authorities. And here is a picture from our lab. Uh, one person trying to focus on these discussions. This is, of course, a lie. Um, it's not from our lab at all. Um, here you are. Um, this is a figure of the model that we use for social media mapping and analysis. Uh, so uh, currently the data scientists have targeted and defined and they're conducting web crawling over a defined time frame, and uh, they're scraping and we're going to parse and we're going to turn this into um, a, a board that we can play with, a storyboard that we can play with uh, to see what we can get out of this. So this uh, scraping started and we're trying to continue it as far as we can into this year to uh, get the discussions about the vaccine as well. Uh, but we have to end it uh, early spring. Uh, so I'm really uh, eager to get this, this data, but it's early days for this this part of the analysis or this part of the project. But we have some material for this third component. That is, what is the role of trust? Uh, in trust in institutions, trust, social uh, trust between citizens, trust in the media. Uh, in, what is the role of trust in shaping short-term behavioral responses? And what is the long-term impact of COVID-19 and the public's uh, handling on levels of trust? And of course, um, the way that we um, think about trust here is something that is negotiated. Uh, we have as we have starting conditions. Again, Norway is a high trust society, uh, but in the times uh, of the pandemic, uh, this type of this type of trust is negotiated uh, as a result of content strategies, as the result of this reception, of course, new uh, events coming in, uh, social media dynamics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, as a result of this uh, negotiation, there is a re-evaluation of trust and fear, and so forth and so on. And the outcome at, at, the, at the right side of the model, we see how we, or we try to, uh, to model this as uh, the way that people behave, the way that they respond to uh, the, the uh, measures introduced by the public health authorities and so forth. And um, I bragged about how we had three surveys uh, that has been fielded uh, or that have been fielded. Um, the first wave was in March uh, last year. The second was in March and April. And then we have the third wave in October and November. And we gotten results from this uh, uh, just before Christmas and we've been playing around with it since. Um, 547 of well, these respons respondents have uh, participated, participated in all three waves, and uh, quite a high number have participated in two of the, those waves as well. Now, the first question we uh, have been interested in is whether or not people felt that uh, measures were exaggerated. Uh, and what we see here is, uh, my apologies for not having had the time to translate this, but uh, what we've seen is that in October, uh, last year that is, 43% um, did not agree to this, whereas 33% uh, did uh, were somewhat in agreement here. So uh, uh, most Norwegians would agree that, well, they didn't think that the public health authorities had exaggerated. They were supporting the measures that had been introduced. Uh, of course, you had people disagreeing, um, but that lot amounted to 5% uh, uh, that would totally disagree, totally, uh, or would agree that, would totally agree that uh, the measures had been exaggerated, and 14%, the light blue, uh, saying that, well, yeah, partly uh, it was, uh, uh, they had gone too far. Um, if we go back to April, we find that this was uh, pretty much the same result. That is, the risk uh, was not seen as something that was overblown. Uh, and a similar question asked in October, again, 
um, it's pretty similar. Uh, I'm not, we're not making too much out of this. That is, uh, there is a strong support that this is our interpretation of this data. It's a strong support amongst Norwegians for the measures that have been introduced by the public health authorities. And we do find some signs of polarization here though. Um, those that have little trust, those that use alternative media and vote for the Progress Party, that is the official party to the very far right in Norway uh, and others even further out on the um, political spectrum, they think the crisis is overblown. And these days we're playing with the concept of stacked uh, stacked conservative beliefs to tease out why some people are flatly refusing vaccines, for instance. Um, and we can see that these views, these uh, conservative views, uh, are something that is really uh, pointing in this direction. If we uh, move to... Can I go, Sorry. Uh, go back for a second yeah, sure. to what you mentioned a couple slides ago? Um, you had been you had the model of trust, and I think also that model is you, it's an organizational trust that you frame. I think on that model, but there's a big difference I think in how we think about that as organizational trust versus um, trust as an interpersonal concept. So, like I mentioned with that example with Gary, I mean, we, there's certain trust people who have trust, and it's typically people like you know newscasters on the news. We come to trust them because of our interactions with them over time. Friends and family, we trust more than people you know we don't know, strangers, and you know a student who gets to know their professor and builds a relationship with them is going to be given more leeway than a student who you don't hardly know. And so that idea of interpersonal trust, I think would be a very different model to think about. And it, and it involves, of course, transparency. But if you think about like influencers, people trust those influencers because they think they know them. There's that parasocial component, which is something I, I'm writing about now in an article, but this idea that we create this sense of relationship, this sense of knowing, and that builds a very strong level of trust. And that's different than this idea of an institutional model. And it, it's still possible within the institutional framework. Yeah, so that's a fair point. Um, and this is something that I'm grappling with because uh, also the difference between organizational rhetoric and interpersonal rhetoric, um, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm not very pleased with the way that we've sold this and the work that we've done so far. So uh, I'll pick this up and I'll also relate it to this model for sure. So thanks, Mike. Um, Going back to this survey, um, we measured the trust in politicians. Um, we measured the trust in the health authorities, uh, both in March and in October. Uh, we've also got measures for the competence um, of uh, these organizations. And what we've seen and what we can see is uh, it's quite, we're quite high levels of trust, I would say. And uh, the trust has not really dwindled much. That is, um, there is a slight difference here in the way that people trust politicians, but uh, as far as the public health authorities, uh, that it has been pretty stable or have actually increased during the crisis. So that I find particularly interesting. Um, we have some questions about the vaccine as well. And again, my apologies for running this in Norwegian, uh, but what we've seen here is that uh, the total number of people saying that uh, it's very likely that I will take the vaccine or it's somewhat likely that I will take, take the vaccine. These are the, the figures in, in green, uh, dark green and light green. Uh, we're talking about over 70% of the Norwegian population. And please bear in mind that this uh, third wave of the survey was fielded in October at the point where there were quite high uncertainties about the vaccine and, and the safety of the vaccine. And uh, well, actually the last news here in Europe uh, is that Germany has uh, said that they're not going to uh, allow the Astra, uh, what, what's the name of the vaccine? Astra. AstraZeneca. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, they're not going to allow uh, that to be used for our older citizens or people over 65. So the trust issue comes in here as well, I think, uh, but we haven't really captured that in this, this survey. Um, there are some interesting other uh, aspects with, of this um, 
this data as well. Um, we're talking about the influence of education. Um, so uh, people with a higher level of education tend to be more positive towards the vaccine. Uh, women worry more than men uh, about the vaccine. Uh, and the old, but the older people uh, have the greatest trust uh, and have show the greatest willingness to take the vaccine, whereas younger people are more skeptical. So again, we're digging into this data to see how it correlates. But uh, there are some uh, people here uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the graph. Um, for instance, these in red uh, saying it's very unlikely that they will take the vaccine. So um, you see uh, these figures being uh, up in the level of 11%, but then also down to 8 um, for the total uh, number of people. So, uh, and those, and also, and, and, uh, can I ask the question, those numbers, if if the vac vaccination will be free, did you ask free, the yeah. question if, if it will be for their money? Uh, it's no, we haven't, we haven't tied it to that question because vaccination in Norway is free. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, and it's uh, voluntary. Of course. And it's going to be voluntary despite what the vaccine uh, or the anti-vaccine people are, are um, saying. Um, uh, Petra has her hand up. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Petra. I noticed that um, the men are more likely to take the vaccine than the women. Correct. Um, but there's no real difference in education. Is there a reason why you think that's the case? Um, we're digging into that as well, but uh, I think from previous research, um, there is this idea that women tend to be more risk averse. I'm, uh, I, but this, I, this is. I've the... read previously, and I, I, I can't know where I read it, but I've read previously that women tend to be more skeptical. Yeah, yeah. Of what is being told. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, I was wondering does that apply to Norwegian women as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's my understanding. But again, I'm not an expert in this area, so uh, I have to trust the other people in in uh, these two just teams. But uh, yeah, um, I will uh, now return. I will now go into uh, this group. I mean, those that I mean, we have to differ or make a difference between those that are flatly refusing and those that are skeptical. Those are two different things. Uh, those that are hesitant and those that are refusing the vaccines. Um, but if we look at uh, some of the reasons for hesitancy and refusal, uh, we find that, um, yeah, sorry. Um, we find that most people that are skeptical, they are afraid of, of um, uh, negative effects of the vaccine, 79%. Um, Forty-three percent um, are afraid that the vaccine is not uh, being developed in a secure way. So, women are overrepresented in this group, and those in the risk group they are really worrying uh, about this aspect. Um, then you have people that are uh, have a low level of trust in general, and also people that believe in conspiracies. Uh, they would argue that, well, uh, I trust alternative treatments much more than the school medicine. Um, and vaccines, they're, they're not really uh, in, in, they're not really, uh, it's not possible to combine it with my value system. Um, and uh, we think that uh, the natural, uh, you, you should get exposed, you should get COVID and you will get well anyway. So it's not, you shouldn't really worry too much. But uh, men uh, are the ones that really uh, set themselves apart. Uh, men uh, with a low worry levels uh, who are not really afraid of uh, the pandemic and think that uh, uh, it's it, the levels of, of COVID-19 in society, it's not high enough to uh, make the vaccine necessary. Uh, and we, if, we keep, if we get COVID-19, uh, we'll get immunity. And uh, that's a much better way to, to do this. But then you have, again, those that are, uh, have a low level of trust and believe in conspiracies. But just to put this in, in perspective, um, 
most of the people that are skeptical, uh, they have concerns stemming from the backside. And those would be women that worry um, and those in the risk group, but they have a low normal level of trust. Uh, but then you have the smaller group to, uh, that's uh, believe that the overall, overall situation in society, it's not that bad. So we don't really need a vaccine. And then you have a tiny group that relies on alternative treatments or points to other values. They're not particularly worried, but they are recognized by having very low levels of trust in the public health authorities. So this is something that we're digging into. Um, again, I mentioned this idea of uh, stocked or stacked conservative beliefs um, that we see. We see a tendency to how reliance on alternative media, um, how uh, skepticism towards the public health authorities, etc., factor into this and make people. Um, more or less take a political stance. Um, and this again is something that we'll, we'll, we will be exploring in further, further research. Any comments, questions about this? Uh, if I may, I, I have a little bit different question. You mentioned yeah. in the beginning that you uh, compare the situation in Norway with other Scandinavian countries. And we all know that Sweden is it's, it's, it's very different ex example that yeah. uh, speaking about quarantines and all, 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 all this stuff, somehow did it affect it to the trust of, of public authorities, their, their strategy of combating COVID-19? Yeah, that's a very so, good question. Um, uh, I know this is quite confusing, but um, I run two projects, um, and one of these projects we have the survey uh, surveys, uh, but this is that is not the comparative project. So uh, what I'm trying to get at is that I don't have survey results from Sweden uh, that has been conducted by my team, but I I have of course Swedish colleagues who have conducted surveys, and from their research, what I've seen is that uh, especially during the first uh, period of the pandemics, Swedes were trusting their governments. Swedes were really satisfied with uh, the way that the pandemic was handled. Uh, but that trust, from my understanding, is that that trust is not there to the same extent these days. Uh, but I would have to go back to my good colleagues in, say, uh, Gothenburg uh, to get the latest results in, in this regard. So, so the, the interesting thing is, of course, this rally around the flag effect that has been discussed in the literature. That is, uh, there is this huge crisis, and now we just have to pull together and support the public authorities. Um, and uh, this is something that I think we've seen uh, in quite a few countries. Um, at least we've seen it in Norway. I think we've seen it in Sweden. I think we've seen it in Denmark. But then at a certain stage, this consensus, this rally around the flag effect, uh, it disappears and, and the consensus starts to crack. Uh, and uh, you get a politicized perspective on the conflict. Why didn't you handle it much better? Why are, haven't we closed the borders already? So in these days, these days in Norway, this is exactly what we're seeing. People are starting to, or the political parties are start, starting to fight out over how this has been handled. But the trust in the public health authorities, that is, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, the Norwegian uh, Directorate of Public Health, uh, that has been, again, uh, pretty stable. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Oh, there's this nice conversation going on in the chat that I've totally missed. Um, yeah, I think I'll actually turn to um, the next slide because what I'm really interested in in these days is uh, the following, let's see. Um, 
Uh, the fourth point that I mentioned that I would like to discuss with you guys is this. Um, what strategies can be devised for risk crisis communication to facilitate social trust in the face of a future pandemic outbreak? Of course, um, I've just gotten into this business of pandemic communication, but I think I've kind of carved out uh, a niche uh, and an academic business strategy, to say the least, uh, because, of course, as we know, uh, future pandemics are bound to happen, uh, and I'll be there uh, with my research teams or whatever. At least that's how I picture it. Um, again, I think I mentioned this already. Um, there, uh, the views on vaccines can be uh, distributed on a continuum. That is from people accepting every vaccines to people uh, refusing every vaccine. And then you have all sorts of positions in between. And the Norwegian public health authorities are very clear in the sense that they're saying, we totally understand that you are skeptical uh, of a vaccine that has been developed in a very, very uh, fast manner. Um, we have um, yeah, we have a total understanding of uh, how you would be uncertain, faced with something that is unknown, uh, and uh, we get it. Um, and then they try to uh, come up with some strategies that will uh, address this, uh, these fears or this, uh, these uh, hesitancies. Um, from previous research, we know that some of the drivers for vaccine hesitancy can be placed in, in three categories. You have complacency, um, you have convenience, uh, and you have confidence. And of course, here in regards of confidence is where communication comes in uh, to the greatest extent, I think. In our material, we have asked people about views on COVID conspiracies. Um, for instance, the microchip thing, the 5G biological warfare, and our material, uh, our respondents, to a great extent, they disagreed with all these, uh, these um, uh, COVID conspiracies. Having said that, though, um, there are a quite sizable number, 15%, uh, that's, I say, well, we're not really sure. And what is more worrying, I would say, is that 18% uh, would say that, yeah, uh, com these conspiracies, they have something going for them. So 15% would agree to at least one of them. Uh, and 3% uh, would agree to uh, one or several of these conspiracies. And what we found was that, again, um, men with little education, young men, um, those that did not trust the health authorities, those that went to alternative media for information, and those with far-right sympathies, uh, they and also um, they were uh, more likely to uh, support uh, conspiracy theories. Can you specify what, what do you mean by alternative media? Because yes. I, I... Yeah, um, in the Norwegian media landscape, you would uh, argue that uh, you have the mainstream media, uh, that is the established publishing houses, uh, the established newspapers, the established uh, television stations. And then we use the term alternative media uh, to be, uh, designate, uh, for instance, websites that would cast themselves off as uh, dealing with all kinds of political and social issues. Uh, but they would be mainly set up to discuss immigration issues. And these uh, websites have typically latched onto the uh, COVID-19 uh, debate as well. And they're reproducing and rehashing uh, a lot of the conspiracies uh, from, for instance, the US in terms of the, the election being stolen from Trump, et cetera, et cetera. So in the Norwegian setting, uh, alternative media would designate those kinds of, of uh, websites. Was that understandable or? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. You. So um, those uh, that um, are hesitant or those that are undecided are not that to say that they're not really sure. Um, those tend to be women uh, with low education. Um, the young and middle-aged uh, are saying, well, um, they might be true. Uh, and the older respondents, um, they're saying, well, we don't really know. But what is common, again, is the low trust in health authorities and media. 
Um, and again, they use alternative media for information. They have often far-right sympathies, but they also belong to another political party in Norway, uh, the Center Party that is, has uh, reinvented itself as a populist party. So uh, I think the term populist uh, political parties is quite fitting in this sense, uh, that the conspiracy believers uh, belong to these types of, of uh, uh, these types of uh, parties. Um, again, my apologies for using Norwegian material, but uh, I'll just walk you through um, a post here uh, about the vaccine. Uh, they are, these people, these social media users are arguing that the prime minister and the, um, the minister of health should be the first in line to take the COVID-19 vaccine at it, and it should be live streamed um, on their web page. Uh, but then other users are saying that, uh, well, they probably don't want to do that, or they're saying that, well, they're just going to fake it uh, with a uh, water injection to make it appear as they've taken the vaccine. So a lot of people are actually believing that the authorities are hiding something, that they are looking for ways to pull wool over the eyes of, of people. Um, and we asked people uh, to what extent they would agree to the statement that the health authorities are more preoccupied with their own interests than the public interest. Um, and also, uh, we questioned people whether or not they would agree to the statement that the authorities are hiding important information about the coronavirus. And uh, of course, the good news here is that uh, most people don't really believe this. Um, they don't really believe that uh, health authorities are fighting for their own interests and that they're hiding uh, important information. There is a huge level of, of trust in the Norwegian uh, Public Health Institute. So that is the good news for the, the, these institutions, of course. But having said that, though, um, the dark blue and light blue um, um, numbers here um, are really <clears throat> those that uh, are totally in agreement with these statements or partly in agreement with these statements. So uh, there, is a, some, there are some people that are skeptical of, of the Norwegian Public Health Institute and the Norwegian uh, Public Health uh, Authorities in general. And they've started to show up outside the parliament um, and uh, showing placards. Uh, these placards are saying, uh, use the medication. Um, and also the politicians have blood on their hands. Um, and uh, this guy was, or this placard uh, in the protest march says, um, resign. Uh, and it's a picture of the Minister of Health uh, saying, resign, we want to celebrate Christmas. Um, and these kinds of demonstrations have, uh, I wouldn't say really grown to this extent, uh, like in Denmark and in the Netherlands where they've turned violent, uh, but there is a sizable part of the population uh, that believe that uh, the lockdown has gone too far, that the COVID-19, it's a hoax, et cetera, et cetera. There aren't that many of these people, um, but they are really, really active on social media. So uh, the public health authorities are sometimes asking themselves, uh, how, sh how should we meet this? Because we can pour, we can use all our resources in say, answering the questions and the comments from the really uh, hardcore skeptics. Uh, and we won't get anywhere. We're just digging a grave for ourselves and using all all our resources. What should we do? Should we pull the plug uh, or should we uh, just leave the comments, the critical comments open or how should we handle this? And um, in my discussions with the public health authorities, I pointed to um, research saying that this pulling the plug or censoring uh, the negative posts would mean that uh, you would uh, put more gasoline on, on the fire and it would uh, create a huge mess. So, so far at least, I think none of the public health institutions have gone down that route. But um, this is uncertain terrain. And again, I'm really eager to hear what you have to say in this regard. Um, 
meanwhile, of course, we're all waiting for Putin to come and rescue us. <laughs> all right. Comments, questions? I'm dying to hear what you think. You know, there's a whole long history of this, I think, you know, like trust in the government and trust in media institutions and trust in, uh, you know, corporations are all part of this. And um, two years ago, we wouldn't have been surprised to know that, you know, that someone doesn't trust. I don't trust pharmaceutical companies. I'm going to say it. Uh, I don't particularly trust most people in the government and I don't particularly trust corporations. So, um, you know, but now that we're having a pandemic, you know, I also understand science. I don't need to have somebody explain to me that wearing a mask is a good idea. And even if it was a fiction, you know, people all over the world wear masks all the time. You know, when you're in China, people wear masks when they're sick and they do it all, they've been doing it for decades. So um, there's no risk to me from doing it, of course. So I'm not gonna not wear a mask because I understand how the disease transmission works. But I think that's part of this is that there is this, long-term trend of, of lack of trust. And we're trying to you know, position this as being relevant to the health issues, but you know, the people don't believe the earth is round and you know, people don't believe in vaccines in general before this ever happened. So there's a whole bunch of systemic issues, I think, going back that are part of this. Agreed. Sure. Maureen Taylor. Maureen Taylor. So a uh, couple things, number one, um, health like everything else in the 20s, 2000s is politicized, right? So uh, there's, it's uh, polarization of everything from education to climate change to health. So that's number one. But number two, this in some ways is an exciting opportunity for public relations, right? So public relations has this opportunity now to change how it functions, to no longer just be that corporate communication model, but to actually help organizations and publics understand each other. In some ways, you know, you mentioned earlier dialogue and engagement, but this is really an opportunity for it, right? This is an opportunity for everything that we teach and do research on, rhetoric, ethos, logos, to come in and to actually perform the functions that we write about in our journals and actually enact it in our communities. So for me, I, I always get excited about this. As I said, I'm working with the WHO and they are using everything that we, are, we have written about, all of us on this call and our professors and everybody else to try to figure out how to resolve this. And I believe that the organizations that treat people ethically, that make decisions that are in the public good during this time of crisis will emerge much stronger. And those that don't, right? Those organizations that lay people off, right? And furlough them and fire them and treat and, and don't give people, you know, an opportunity to pay back, right? So it's either rent or it's um, credit cards or things like that. Those that make short-term decisions will remember because I'm gonna make sure I remember and I tell everybody else that I remember. So I just see this, I think we need to have, we, as a field, we need to take the conversation and say, what's our role in this? Because we've already seen with horror what our role has, when we're not uh, out there advocating on behalf of all of these other issues, what happens? Because they've taken the people, the trolls, and the, uh, the people who are politicizing uh, the health, they've taken everything that we've taught and they're using it for their ends. I think it's time for us to use it for our ends. Taylor, out. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree and what I've been saying to people is that for once for once in my life people are interested in what I'm doing um, it's, it's just fascinating uh, I mean I'm getting contacted by people saying oh you gotta need you gotta come on board on this application that application we need somebody with the insight on communication um, so I'm having a blast I, please don't tell anyone but um it's yeah, thanks. The village secret. Um, it's it's um, it's actually very very um, fascinating. Also to feel that we can make a difference because we have this knowledge about communication that we could uh, help uh, the practitioners with. Of course, there are tons and tons of knowledgeable practitioners out there, and and working with them is just fantastic. I have to say. 
Um, and uh, at least in the Norwegian system, we have had the luxury of being uh, met with open arms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm writing an application these days uh, targeting vaccine communication. Um, it's going to be a huge uh, project if we land it. Uh, and I've gotten interest from people from the faculty of medicine, mm -hmm. from anthropologists, etc., etc. And it's just so fascinating to be working cross-disciplinary on these issues. Uh, and seeing how public relations can uh, contribute to these other uh, fields and of course take a lot back as well. Um, and and just, just to give you a brief idea here, um, I uh, one afternoon I tried to put uh, together an advisory board for this application um, and I contacted the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, I contacted the Norwegian Directorate of Public Health, and I contacted the Ministry of Public Health as well. So three public institutions and their communication directors. And within, I think it was 30 minutes, I had them all on board uh, of this uh, new proposal. Because again, uh, they're really interested in what public relations has to offer. Mm -hmm. So, I, I have one one question. Very interesting. You've just mentioned the the interest to communications and public relations from the medical authorities. I'm just uh, now uh, compiling one course, uh, and I want to uh, cooperate with medical universities. Do in 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 Norway. Uh, how say in medical university do they study communications or not just if... um yeah they do, do they have uh, course yeah uh but uh only on the interpersonal level uh so mm -hmm. the, uh, the doctor not meeting like this mm -hmm. no um of course, uh, at my university, there are lots of sociologists working at the Faculty of Medicine as well. And those are, of course, my, my entry point uh, to uh, discuss with the true, quote unquote, uh, medical people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, but, you know, uh, as much as I would say, this is a fantastic time period, etc. Um, for public relations, uh, my team member from Denmark uh, runs into a total different, uh, has a total different situation. She hasn't got the access to the public health authorities that we in Norway have. And we've been trying to sell the idea that we could actually help out. Um, and uh, the Danish public health authorities feel, think that they've already, they've got it sussed. They got it sorted. Um, they don't need any outside advice. Um, so different situations in different, uh, in different countries, that's for sure. Or, or maybe, maybe you are familiar with... Uh... Uh, this British government concept uh, behavior be, be, behavior change will you know mm -hmm. this nudge theory that uh, it's uh, sometimes you should uh, put the person in right environment uh, and uh, and that person will will act what what do you think about it I've got just very very brief uh, knowledge about the nudge theory but uh, mm -hmm. From my initial reading, it, it's a little bit um, uh, paternalistic. It's, it's a little bit too manipulative for me. Uh, hence, mm -hmm. I prefer to stay in the rhetorical uh, tradition where you will actually uh, say that you cannot really manipulate people um, for a long period of time. Uh, so you need to pay attention to their values, uh, their premises, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to work with people and just not try to, to manipulate them. But when, when we are in the, in the, in the situation of, uh, of uh, a pandemic, for example, social distance, uh, distance. If, yeah. if you put in supermarket uh, some special signs and special barriers, so, so people will do automatically. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, as I remember it, uh, reading up on health campaigns uh, back in the 90s, 80s, 
um, you would point to the different tools you ha have at your disposal. Uh, and physical tools uh, would be one thing, obviously, uh, uh, having some kind of economic tools, uh, taxes and levies and whatnot. Uh, uh, but then, of course, information would be at the very, would be the weakest tool, as I remember it. Uh, Salmon, uh, wasn't that the name of the guy? Health campaigns? Rice, Rice, At Rice and Atkin and, and uh, Charles Salmon. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, they yeah. have a great, they actually, their health communication book or their communication campaigns book is now like in the fourth edition, I think. Yeah. So that would be a good place to look. Yeah. True. Another thing that I have to revisit. Um, um I just, uh, yeah, a question. Uh, because you've done uh, political communication and now you're doing health communication and we have like these kind of uh, um, um, arguments around how politicians are um, sort of um, shaping their policies, uh, their pandemic policies for the upcoming elections. So yeah. was that an issue in Norway uh, yeah, it's, in terms it's of like it's growing to be an issue. Uh, the political parties are positioning themselves and saying, we could have done the job much better and why aren't you doing this and why aren't you doing that? Um, and also we see some, some tension between cities run by one political party uh, that is not in the government. Um, I'm arguing against the government and saying, you're just you know, giving us a hard time and you're not doing this correctly. So yeah, totally, it's getting politicized. Definitely. And and moreover, it's uh, it's uh, it's supported by media. You know, I I ask I, I I made the exercise for my students, and I ask them to calculate how many spokespersons in TV shows speaks about COVID nineteen, and you will surprise that uh, we had the majority of politicians, politologists, politicologists, blah blah blah. So much less medical doctors, you know, practitioners and so on. And that's, uh, so people start to, to receive the information from, from, from people who, who have no clue about this pandemic. That's... Um, Deb had her hand up a second ago. I don't know if she still wanted to say something. Uh, she put it down again. Did you want to say something, Deb? Yes, sorry. Um... Oh, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, I just think that it's really interesting that women are more sceptical because um, I did some research many years ago looking at the HPV vaccination program. That's the human papillomavirus. And women's bodies are medicalised from a very early age, you know. So girls um, and mothers and women, because of pregnancy, um, going to their doctors is quite a, a normal thing for women, whereas men are much more loath. Uh, generally to visiting doctors and there's been research that's looked at that specifically so it's really interesting that that women are more skeptical at this point I do think though that at the end of the day it's that old basic paradigm of risks and benefits so you know it's communicating and this is really basic 101 health communication it is just well if the risks if the benefits outweigh the risks then most people will probably eventually come on board that 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 would be what I, I would understand it to be and even though women may be skeptical now um they might also be the ones that are more likely to push their husbands at some point to go and get the vaccine and I also think there's at the, there's always power into this so we look at some of these men that might be saying um oh you know the the, the risks of the of the uh coronavirus outweigh um, you know, my personal concerns and things like this. this is, they, are they not just trying to reassert their own power in some way? Is, 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 do you look at that in any way? Um, I, like I said, I'm putting together a new application for another project. Uh, and hopefully those are the things that we will be able to explore more in depth. 
Um, I will, in this team that I'm putting together, again, I'm working with people from the Faculty of Medicine, and uh, we're trying to get access to some of the local, um, local municipalities um, and the doctors there, um, and also trying to get at other uh, health professionals, because at least in Norway, um, the um, support for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is much higher amongst medical doctors. But when you move further down the hierarchy um, and you talk with nurses, um, quite a lot of nurses are skeptical. Uh, and we're trying to dig into that. And then we also get uh, this perspective on, on uh, minorities, and we get the gender perspective in there as well. And there are lots and lots of different dynamics at play here that we hope to, uh, to explore further. So fingers when, crossed. Uh, when you say minorities, you mean uh, the em uh, immigrants or, yeah. or minorities? For, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like urban minorities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Norwegian Somali, uh, Pakistani Somali, uh, or, sorry, uh, Norwegian Pakistani, uh, Norwegian Somali, etc., etc. Because, uh, as probably is the case in many other countries as well, um, quite a few of these minorities uh, live in, in uh, there are social issues tied to this, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they live quite frequently in small flats. Uh, families are quite large. Uh, they work in, in uh, they have jobs where they meet face-to-face uh, -face with people. They're more exposed to, to, um, to uh, what's it called? They're more, more exposed to, to the pandemic, um, to COVID-19. They were more exposed to the virus um, and cannot work from home, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I'm, I'm painfully aware that when I'm talking about this, being very enthusiastic and providing a wonderful opportunity, I speak from a very, very privileged position, of course. Um, and uh, this is by no way to under, under you know, underplay the troubles that the pandemic causes also in the Norwegian society. And again, we hope to look into that in this other project. Well, that's the same How, that's I, comment you had earlier about the uh, doctor saying that uh, you, you're just hoping this would happen. I mean, there is that you know sense that like this happens and we are excited because we are excited about communication. We're not excited that you know there's a pandemic, people are dying, but we get to study something exciting. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and what is the level of trust to, to European healthcare authorities? Brussels. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, Norway is not a part of the European Union. Um, ah, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. But of course, uh, we're influenced by uh, the decisions made by the European Union all the time. Um, we have a cooperation uh, with the European Union, and we're also part of this this uh, system where we purchase vaccines through the European uh, Union. Uh, so when, when now um, this, uh, the troubles with the new vaccine from Astra um, uh, affects us to a great extent as well. And did you, did you uh, research the formats of communication? Which formats were the most trustful? Trans trust for, uh, trustworthy uh, from the uh, Norwegian general public. Tele uh, television, uh, social right. media. Yeah. yeah, what we find is that during crisis, uh, people tend to uh, to uh, converge towards traditional media. Uh, it's the Norwegian broadcasting system, the oldest. Uh, uh, channel previously a monopoly um, that channel is uh, the place where people uh, go for their news but then of course you have those that say that we won't have anything to do with uh, the mainstream media uh, we are we have our own channels where we got the true unquote un quote unquote uh, news so but as I pointed out um, use of social media or alternative media uh, in, in the Norwegian setting means that it's kind of driving the, the conspiracy and the polarization and all these kinds of things. 
I just wonder uh, that you measure some kind of uh, self-efficacy of individual level out of the yes. respondents. Yeah, um, we've asked about self-efficacy as well, and I didn't have time to go into this, but it's it's a massive data set. I can tell you that, and we're having <laughs> playing with it. Um, um, and I'm, I'm wondering what, when I can get the time to mine this whole da data set into completion, but we'll see. I just wonder, is not a difference between the woman and man? Is it also the, you also find some difference from the AZ group? Probably it, can, it might be influenced by the self-efficacy or response efficacy regarding yeah. these issues, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, all I can say is that uh, we have to look further into that. Um, I'll put my best political scientists and survey specialists on this and uh, they will crack it and come up with some figures and I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Oh, any other questions? I was, I was just going to say um, that in Australia, when we actually had a political campaign that was very much centred on a vaccination program, and that was again goes back to the um, HPV vaccination program, where the um, Prime Minister of Australia at the time uh, rolled out this free vaccination that was worth about four hundred and twenty dollars per child per girl, um, and he he used it um, to kind of position it as he was like the father figure. He was like the father of Australia and he, he really capitalised on that narrative. Um, and so bringing in, and his, his popularity was really lagging at the time and it won in the election by promising to um, cure cervical cancer um, and, and rid the country of, of cancer. So there's always political skin in the game, I think, in, in any of this. And, and we're certainly seeing that being played out in Australia at the moment with different states all having different uh, kinds of policies around how to, to deal with, with the virus. But um, yeah, I just thought I, I'd throw that in. It, you know, this political kind of idea, I think it's always really, really close to the service. Yeah, thank you. And I, I also, I'm also fascinated by, by the type of metaphors that have been used by political leaders. You mentioned uh, him positioning him as a, himself as a father figure. Uh, I think you, we've seen sort of the same thing in Denmark, where the prime minister has cast herself off as the mother figure of the nation, but the quite stern mother figure telling you that you should brush your teeth and you know keep keep distance and so forth and wear a mask. Um, in Norway, um, we have this uh, wonderful tradition of communal work. Um, and that metaphor has been used to a great extent in, uh, in, the, uh, in the crisis. Uh, everybody has to chip in. Everybody has to be mm -hmm. a part. Mm. And if you're not doing that, we're not going to chastise you. But uh, it's kind of a social pressure thing. Um, and also something that uh, Norwegians are expected to chip in to be a part of this. Um, mm. In Sweden, um, they have a totally different way of rigging their bureaucracy. So uh, the public health authorities have a much, uh, have taken the lead, so to speak, um, in the pandemic uh, and have uh, had to bear the responsibility uh, uh, for the direction. And the politicians have come in at a later stage uh, saying that we're actually taking over now because this, this hasn't worked out, the Swedish strategy that was led by the bureaucrats. Uh, it hasn't uh, played out well. So we're going to take over now and introduce the measures that the rest of the world has been playing with or has, has introduced. Um, in Norway, the public health authorities have a different position. Uh, they have been overruled by the politicians uh, at certain points. Uh, early on, uh, the politicians have taken stricter measures than was recommended by the public health authorities. Um, and uh, the public health authorities, at least officially, are saying that we're quite happy with this because um, it's the, the elected politicians are the ones that should take the full responsibility um, because those people we can vote out in the next election, uh, whereas we as bureaucrats, as professionals, we would like to stay on and you know, do our thing. So different ways of rigging this. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, why don't we wrap it up since I think we're getting near the end of where we usually are. If you want to make any final comments and then we'll uh, wrap it up for today. I, I forgot to bring my toothbrush, uh, but uh, I should have done that. It's uh, over bedtime for me. Um, thank you so much for showing up. I really appreciate that. Uh, wonderful comments, ideas, insights. I will take note of them. And hopefully um, if I behave right, Michael might have me back at one stage or not. <laughs> It'll be next year, though, because this year's all booked out. But yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> all right, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take bye. care. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you. Happy bye. New Year, bye. everyone. Bye. 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 See you later. And I'll uh, have the recording up sometime later today if anybody wants to share it or have access to it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.